What's up guys, I'm Justin Burkholtz and it is time for another book review. Alright, so this week I am covering the book Sacred Nature by Karen Armstrong. It's a really cool book I'm excited to get into, but before we get to the good stuff, if you're interested in mysticism, uh, history of religion, or science-based protocols for improving longevity, health, and wellness, and want to support my effort to bring this content in an accessible format to a wide audience for free here on YouTube, make sure to hit subscribe if you haven't already, and uh, consider supporting me on Patreon or with a one-time donation. Those links can be found below. All right, so let's talk about Sacred Nature by Karen Armstrong. So on the back it says, an urgent manifesto and a practical guide on how to rekindle our spiritual bond with nature, drawing on the wisdom of the world's religious traditions. So the book, um, has a number of chapters here. I'm going to show you real fast so you can see the way it's broken down. Basically 10 chapters here. And so the way that it's organized is that each chapter of the book covers a different topic related to uh, nature and spirituality. And Karen talks about the history of uh, that certain concept like say the holiness of nature and she'll bring in references from pretty much all of the world's great spiritual traditions so I think it says I uh, was on a different blurb somewhere uh, that she covers from uh, the book of Job to Thomas Aquinas from Lao Tzu to Wood Wordsworth uh, and more and so she really does cover um, classical Chinese philosophy um, you know Judeo-Christian monotheistic uh, philosophy and how they related to nature as well as indigenous cultures and more. <laughs> she talks about uh, how Islam specifically um, is geared towards a sacred view of nature as well and how um, kind of in modernity we've kind of lost that uh, view of the, the sacredness of nature um, because of the kind of reductive materialist uh, worldview that we all share today. So what's really cool about the book is that each chapter goes back to the past to talk about how humans related to nature in the past and it talks about how we've kind of lost that today, maybe why we lost that. She talks a little bit about religious history and philosophical history and uh, then it talks about how we can regain that connection with nature that the ancient people had, not by kind of uh, regressing and going back to a primitive worldview because it's not possible. So what we need to do is we need to create new practices that work within our modern, you know, rational scientific worldview, but that still uh, venerate nature and resacralize uh, the natural world so that we take better care of it and live in better harmony uh, with nature. So Karen Armstrong is actually a historian of religion and so she has a very deep um, knowledge of the world's spiritual traditions and she really puts this on uh, to best use I would say in this book Sacred Nature because she shows us um, both the the power uh, and beauty of the similarities between different religious traditions and also um, how their uniqueness is also beautiful as well. And so I really like when people are able to do that. It shows a much more mature um, perspective and worldview as a scholar and as a teacher uh, when people are able to see things more uh, multidimensional. I uh, like that instead of just being, um, you know, blocked by their own personal prejudices and biases. So instead of saying that, oh, every worldview or every religion other than my own is wrong and that's why you should convert to mine, instead of you know, operating with that kind of approach, instead she shows how each tradition had uh, good things to offer humanity and, um, you know, why those 
those teachings became traditions in the first place is that they were effective for people. They, they helped people uh, live better lives, um, have a better sense of shared community, shared ethics, etc. And so she really is good on uh, drawing out the beauty of the world's different spiritual traditions. So she reviews all of those traditions from the past to uncover different practices, perspectives, and attitudes around nature um, that allowed people to, like I said, live in better harmony with nature and have a better um, view of the natural world of our uh, plant and animal brothers and sisters. And, uh, you know, those people typically uh, lived in a more sustainable way than we do today, um, in large part because of how they viewed nature. And so, the point of the book is to help nudge us back towards that uh, view of the sacredness and the holiness of nature so that we can stop our current path towards a catastrophe that we are clearly on uh, right now. And I think also personally that having that deeper connection with nature um, solves very personal uh, existential problems that a lot of people deal with as well as this greater existential threat that humanity as a whole is facing as far as you know environmental catastrophe <laughs> goes um, but the personal existential problems that are um, treated or, or helped by having a, a connection with nature are that it really gives you a sense of connection to something larger than yourself which is where we get a sense of meaning and purpose from in the first place. So uh, I think it's a really good way to improve our personal uh, quality of life and our collective sustainable uh, way of life as well. Sacred Nature is a relatively small book, short book. It's about 200 pages total, including index and everything. The book itself is around 175 pages with 10 chapters. So it's very short and to the point, but she manages to get a lot of, like I said, religious uh, history and comparative religion discussion into each chapter of the book and also provide a uh, section at the end of each chapter that she titles The Way Forward where she provides guidance on how we can create a practice or an attitude to recover those ancient ways of um, interacting with the natural world. So for instance, chapter one is called Mythos and Logos, and she talks about how those were the two different ways about uh, that people spoke about the world. So um, those are ancient Greek terms, and so Logos was more of the rational way of looking at uh, the world and mythos um, was more of a narrative or a story that allowed us to have a shared sense of community. Uh, it, it tells us how to uh, act ethically, how to uh, interact with other human beings, with the natural world, with uh, mystery, uh, etc. And so mythos is a very important um, part of human culture and uh, of development, but over time its importance has been forgotten mostly and so we've kind of um, veered towards only logos and only talking about the kind of scientific, rational, kind of materialist, reductionist view of uh, reality and that will not ever be able to tell us how to live ethically or how to live in harmony with nature, those kinds of more important questions, uh, I would say. Um, and so mythos is very important and it needs to be recovered. And this is not a new idea uh, for anyone who is familiar at all with Joseph Campbell. Uh, this should ring a lot of bells. <laughs> That's basically his entire life's work was telling people, listen, we have messed up. We've got this myth thing, this mythos thing totally wrong, and it's actually really important, probably the most important thing, is to have a narrative or a myth to live by, and we need to recover that. And so that's what her first uh, chapter is about. So just to give you an example of how 
uh, she writes, I want to quote a little bit from her here. So this passage from chapter one says, myth is not an inferior method of inquiry that can be cast aside when people have attained the age of reason. It is not an early attempt at history. It does not claim to be objectively true. Rather, it helps us to glimpse new possibilities. In art, liberated from the constraints of logos, we conceive and combine new forms of expression that enrich our lives and tell us something important, giving us fresh insight into the disturbing puzzle of our world. Thus, a myth is true because it is effective. The myths that we shall consider persisted for centuries because they worked when people translated them into action. A myth is essentially a guide. It tells us what to do to live more richly and effectively. All right, so like I said, if you are familiar with the work of Joseph Campbell, this will you know, uh, be very familiar territory for you in chapter one. From there, she does depart from that theme um, and she talks much more about um, specifically about nature. The reason she brings mythos up is that the ancient peoples, indigenous peoples, myths um, all, uh, you know, unanimously um, voiced the sacredness of nature. And so she starts there because those are kind of our earliest cultural uh, memories and, um, you know, lingering um, apparitions uh, from those early times in our human uh, existence and culture. And so it gives us a, a glimpse of how the early people saw the world, how the ancient people saw the world. And so the best way to figure out how they saw the world is to look at their myths that survived to this day. And then we can take a look at our modern myths and how those are different. And we do have modern myths. Uh, a lot of people aren't aware of this and they aren't intentional about what myth they live by. Uh, like people, you know, would have been in ancient times. They would have had fewer myths <laughs> to choose from or that they were aware of. But today we have our own myths. We're just not really intentional about following them and using them to guide our lives. So she talks about how we can regain that aspect of human culture as well. Okay, so that's chapter one. But as she says, each of the following chapters explores ideas, attitudes, or practices that were essential to the way people experienced nature in the past. Each chapter offers a building block that will help us to create or discover within ourselves a new attitude towards the natural world and so deepen our spiritual commitment to the environment. The attitudes and uh, ideas that she covers include the sacredness of nature, the holiness of nature, the brokenness of our world, the power of sacrifice, the benefits of gratitude, uh, kenosis, or the emptying of the self, the golden rule, and ahimsa, or nonviolence. And like I said, each chapter begins with a historical overview and some comparative religion discussion, talking about how that concept um, may be similar in different traditions or different within different traditions. And then it moves on to a uh, practical, the way forward section, where she introduces a specific practice or gives you some guidance on how you can create a practice to recover that attitude. For me, it was really those endings of the chapters that was the most poignant and stood out to me the most and that I was the most interested in because my focus is more on the practical spiritual practice side of things. I do love learning all of the history and the philosophy as well. Um, it's just not the area that I personally focus on because we can't, can't focus on everything. Um, so I really enjoyed that part of the book and it's a big reason of why I picked it up in the first place. But I was really impressed with Karen's knowledge of religious history and comparative religion. Um, it, it was really outstanding, considering I have 
you know, consumed hundreds of hours of uh, content uh, online um, in that realm and read quite a few books here as well in the same vein. Um, she brought up uh, new information I hadn't be heard before as well as um, reiterated a lot of things that I'd heard, you know, elsewhere and that I, I know to be true and very important as far as understanding our cultural history and how we got to the point we are today, spiritually and philosophically. So that part of the book is also very impressive, especially if you don't have any background in comparative religion or religious studies, you will learn a lot um, in, in this book. It could be a really good introduction to that kind of pursuit for you. But the practical side is, like I said, the part that stood out to me the most. So I just wanna give you a quick uh, quote from her on uh, kind of what that looks like in the book. So in one of the sections she uh, titles The Way Forward. This is from the chapter on kenosis or emptying of the self, which is a kind of uh, process of uh, ego dissolution, you could say. She says this, so every day, first thing in the morning and at night, for just a few moments, we should consider three things. How little we know, how frequently we fail in kindness to other beings, and how limited are our desires and yearnings, which so often begin and end in ourself. So that's an example of part of the section um, at the end of each chapter where she kind of guides you on how to recover this uh, attitude of the past. So um, it's a really good example of the practicality of the book. So you can see that for yourself. To be honest, I was pretty sure I would love this book. Um, as soon as I saw the name, I didn't even hesitate for a second to buy it. But it still surpassed my expectations. Karen's depth of knowledge is impressive like I said before, and her passion for nature and for rekindling our connection to nature is really inspiring. And the book reads like a combination of Joseph Campbell, John Verveke, and Rupert Sheldrake, um, somehow, which if you're not familiar with them is really high praise. They're some of my favorite people uh, in this space. And somehow she kind of, um, converges all those fields, the power of myth and tradition, um, the power of spiritual practices and connecting with nature, and the history of uh, religion and philosophy that brought us to this point of uh, crisis that we're in. And she really brings all three of those kind of perspectives and strains together and weaves them into one beautiful tapestry of a book that is sacred nature. So. If you're interested in environmentalism, religious history, comparative religion, or uh, nature mysticism, you know, practices to connect with nature, this is going to be a must-read book for you. I highly, highly recommend it. So if you're interested in picking up a copy, I will have a link below for you so you can pick one up. And if you have any questions, or anything, you can leave the comment for me as well. I'd love to hear from you. And make sure you check out my other um, book reviews that I did as well on uh, Rational Mysticism by John Horgan and A Real Magic by Dean Radin. Both of those were excellent books and I have review video reviews up on the channel, so check them out. And lastly, huge thank you to my patrons who are supporting me and my work your support is greatly appreciated. If anyone else feels like they enjoy my content and feel that it's valuable and want to support me and my efforts, like I said, I have a link to my Patreon, one-time donations, my eBooks, or coaching below as well. Okay, well, I hope you all have a great day. See you again soon.